As long as I'm President of the United States, Iran will never be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. Tensions between China and the United States have been increasing over trade, coronavirus, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and now the South China Sea. It takes a few to make war, but it takes a village and a nation to build peace. Hold your fire. A podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hi, I'm Rob Malley. And I am Naz Modirzadeh. Welcome to this new episode of Hold Your Fire. The main topic of today's episode is going to be a conversation with uh, Aaron Miller, a dear friend, but and also somebody who's advised uh, countless secretaries of state in the United States, and who's going to be talking to us about Trump's out-of-the-box foreign policy and answering the question whether it is actually delivering results. Before we do that, I uh, wanted to talk to you, Naz, about some of the events that have occurred over the past week, and there have been quite a few. Yes, indeed. I, I think we haven't had a quiet week so far, and, and this one was no exception. Um, what, what have you been paying close attention to this week, Rob? Well, I think there have been a number of, of, of events that, you know, you could look at and say they may foreshadow worse things to come. Obviously, one of them that has already turned to conflict is events in Nagorno-Karabakh, that region that used to be part of Azerbaijan that, 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 that broke away at the end of the Soviet Union, and where you've seen a flare-up of fighting in the last few days, pretty serious fighting between mm. Azerbaijan on the one hand, Nagorno-Karabakh, which is supported by Armenia on the other, with the possibility of direct confrontation between, uh, well, some already confrontation between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and the possibility of outside actors, Turkey, Russia, getting involved. And just that this is one reflection I'd have, and we, I'm sure we'll come back to it, we'll invite uh, our analysts to, to talk about it. And we have one analyst who's Armenian, one who's Azerbaijani, mm. so we try to get as much of the perspective from the two sides as possible. But I, I was in Baku in Erevan uh, maybe eight months ago. And what struck me, we talk about Nagorno-Karabakh as a frozen conflict. What struck me then was how little it will take for it to thaw, because... On the Azerbaijani side, what I felt was this impatience with the status quo that is to their disfavor, since uh, on the ground, uh, the uh, Armenia-backed people in Nagorno-Karabakh control the territory, you know, are in possession of the territory, and uh, the Azerbaijanis felt that nothing was going to move. And I, I came out of there fearing that at some point, they would try to flex their military muscles to at least uh, gain the world's attention, and that appears to be happening now. Mm, and I think in a sense, kind of foreshadowing our conversation with Aaron coming up, I sense that in looking at the news from a number of countries involved, that there is a, this constant effort by other countries to try to discern what is going on with the Trump administration's foreign policy. What are their priorities? How are they approaching these issues? And I think another issue that I was tracking this week involving Turkey was, of course, this this ongoing uh, standoff in the Mediterranean between Greece and Turkey. We had a visit to Greece by Secretary of State Pompeo. And I think a, a, the question in both the Greek and Turkish media and discussions about what is the U.S. approach, how is the U.S. aligning itself between these two actors and is there a sense in which there is an attempt to negotiate some kind of agreement or settlement before the elections in the U.S.? And I think a lot of I saw a lot of discussion in the Greek press about whether or not the U.S. was serious about pressuring Erdogan to limit his engagements and back off on the pressure over issues related to the continental shelf and access to resources in the Mediterranean. I and mean, there's a, a common country, and again, an issue I would love to come back to, which is Turkey's role and Turkey's mm. sense both of being, some, to some extent, besieged. You know, it's surrounded, it believes, particularly in the Mediterranean by a ring of hostile countries, but also on the, on the offense. And if you look at the number of conflicts that Turkey is involved in or says that it will get involved in, Iraq, Syria, Greece, the Eastern Med, as you, as you just mentioned, Nagorno-Karabakh, where Turkey has come out very clearly in favor of Azerbaijan, Libya, which we spoke about a few weeks ago. There's a theme coursing yeah. through this, uh, the, this region, and Turkey's at the center of it. And part of our job at Crisis Group is not, you know, not to come out and condemn, but, but to try to understand what's motivating Turkey's behavior and, and what to do to try to assuage its, its, its fears. But at the same time, try to make sure that uh, its, its behavior doesn't lead to, uh, to aggravated conflict. 
And I mentioned one other thing that struck me this past few days, which is the warning by the United States that it would close down its embassy in, in Baghdad, in Iraq. And um, it's, I've been talking to Iraqi officials. They claim that they've been doing everything to try to protect the American embassy. You know, the reason that the Trump administration is giving is that there have been Shia militia in Iraq that have been targeting the U.S. embassy in the green zone. And they've said if that doesn't stop, they will shut down. They claim it hasn't stopped and they are now threatening very imminently to shut it down. I think what it tells me is two things. First, there's a domestic dimension in the U.S., which is that Secretary Pompeo does not want to see a repeat of what happened uh, in Benghazi when the, the U.S. mission there was attacked uh, and, and their ambassador, the U.S. ambassador, was killed. And that is something that, you know, scarred uh, the United States and which Secretary Pompeo at the time, a member of Congress, used to really go after the Secretary Clinton, Secretary Hillary Clinton, under the Obama administration. He doesn't want to see a repeat of that, nor does anyone else in the administration. I think the other dimension, which in some ways is more, is more worrisome, is that people are speculating that this could be a way for the United States to, to remove one of the constraints to its freedom of maneuver against Shia militia in Iraq, or even against Iran itself. Because as long as the embassy is there with its personnel, it is uh, sort of a sitting duck, vulnerable to attacks by uh, pro-Iranian militia in Iraq. And so some people in Iraq and elsewhere are reading this as a potential, not because the U.S. is determined to go to war, but at least to free its hands so that at the, at the first provocation, it could unleash what Secretary Pompeo has said would be extraordinarily harsh responses to any attack. And that response, again, could, could be confined to Iraq or could find its way into Iran itself. So another thing that I think we need to worry about, and I want to ask you about one more, sorry, and then we, we will get to the, the meat of our conversation, which is, again, reports that the U.S. may be moving towards designating the Houthis, Iran-backed rebel group in, in Yemen, designating it as a terrorist organization, which, again, uh, is probably not the best thing for diplomacy, but wondering what, what, what you made of that. Yeah, absolutely. I think another um, arena in which part of this seems to be, again, a kind of question of the place itself, but then also the ways in which actors are being used as proxies for the Iran-U.S. Uh, conflict. And and indeed, there seems to be talk of uh, the designation of the, of the Houthis as a foreign terrorist organization, which in U.S. law is the best way to ensure that you create significant, if not uh, entirely blocking obstacles to any engagement with a group that is so designated. So it creates ways in which one, U.S. government entities themselves, so everyone from DOD to State Department, diplomats, military actors, would be legally barred from negotiating with and uh, engaging with, in a myriad of ways, the designated group and would also criminalize so-called material support to the group or any members of that group. And I, I, I'd love to know what you think of this as a from a diplomacy perspective, Ron, but I know that when we think about this issue from an international law perspective, I think it can have dramatic and far-reaching consequences because of the effect of a designation on the capacity of individuals to engage in any transactions that go through U.S. banks, which is essentially most financial transactions in the world, this can in effect be a form of sanctions, uh, far more powerful and immediate than other kinds of multilateral or even bilateral sanctions on trade or arms embargoes. So it's used sparingly, and it has generally been thought of as an extreme foreign policy measure, that that kind of designation as a foreign terrorist organization really means the U.S. has the intention of prohibiting that group from participating in any attempts to bring an end to a conflict, negotiate a peace, etc. So it, I think this is the reason, for example, that despite much debate in the U.S. Congress, we did not see a designation of the Afghan Taliban as a foreign terrorist organization because there was a sense that uh, that would prohibit the kind of engagement that we're seeing now. Um, and indeed, there was a I think there was a quick reaction from the Houthis saying 
the U.S. has a, a floating notion of the idea of terrorism. And I would guess very much an awareness within Yemen that the consequences of such a designation would be significant across the board for humanitarian assistance, for access. I think a, a, a problematic move, certainly for the Yemeni population. Yeah, I'd say based on experience, the two ways, the two immediate ways in which it, it, it affects uh, the situation is one, as you say, the humanitarians always, always complain that when that happens, their ability to provide assistance in areas that are controlled by that designated organization you know, collapses. And, you know, in the case of the Houthis, they are in control not of a majority of the country, but of a majority of the population. Yeah. And if humanitarians can interact with them, it means that those people will be deprived of, of what they need to sustain themselves. The second way, more parochially, for an organization like ours, and we, we encounter this across the globe because we are incorporated in the United States, this does put some restrictions on what we could do with those organizations so designated. We could talk to them. But the definition of material assistance is so broad. I mean, the U.S. Supreme Court has gone so far as to say that if I were to meet with a designated organization and try to convince them by training them to forsake violence and to engage in nonviolent, peaceful resistance, something that one would assume would be in the interest of U.S. foreign policy, that would be considered illegal material assistance, unlawful material assistance. So it goes very far. And whatever one thinks of the Houthis, it's hard to see how this would be a, uh, a positive move. But again, issues that I'm sure we'll come back to, particularly I'd love to come back to the question of Nagorno Karabakh, Turkish foreign policy and the Eastern Mediterranean. But I think now it's so, I'm really looking forward to turning to our conversation with Aaron. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. So it's uh, my absolute pleasure to welcome Aaron Miller on uh, on this podcast. A disclaimer, he and I have been friends, colleagues in the Clinton administration for now uh, over two decades. We've been having a running conversation about America's role in the world for 20 years. And I can't think of anyone better to come talk to us today about America's role in the world and in particular in the Middle East. For those who don't know Aaron, he's worked for and advised countless secretaries of state. I'm, I've lost count, but I'm sure you could tell us. Uh, and the author of several books, uh, both on the Middle East and about American presidents. Uh, before we start, I, I'd like to just listen to a clip, a, so a soundbite from what uh, President Trump just said at his speech at the UN General Assembly last week. This month, we achieved a peace deal between Serbia and Kosovo. We reached a landmark breakthrough with two peace deals in the Middle East after decades of no progress. Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain all signed a historic peace agreement in the White House with many other Middle Eastern countries to come. They are coming fast, and they know it's great for them, and it's great for the world. These groundbreaking peace deals are the dawn of the new Middle East. By taking a different approach, we have achieved different outcomes, far superior outcomes. We took an approach, and the approach worked. The approach worked, Aaron. Those are those are pretty strong words. And and part of the reason I've been looking for a reason to invite you on this podcast, but what sparked my attention was you wrote a, a piece, uh, uh, I think a week or so ago, in which you said that what the Trump administration has proved, at least, is that one of the conventional wisdoms about Arab-Israeli peacemaking, which was that you first needed an Israeli-Palestinian agreement before Arab states would normalize with Israel, has been turned on its head, and turned on its head by the Trump administration. So tell us a little bit, did this new approach work? Yeah, I mean, I would only say before we begin that it, our dialogue over the years has been incredibly rich and robust. And uh, I would only quote, maybe it's apocryphal, the line from Churchill, that those who don't change their minds change nothing. And Rob Malley has adjusted and calibrated his views as reality has changed. And that's what I think I'm forced to do, was forced to do in this piece. Uh, I remember meeting with Mr. Kushner in 2017, 2018, and he made it clear to me that they were much more interested. He didn't describe it this way, but it was clear to me the 22 state solution rather than the two state solution. And that they were going to invest strategically in the Arabs, particularly the Saudis and the Emiratis. First trip an uh, American president unprecedented took was not to Britain, not to Canada, not even to Mexico, but to Saudi Arabia. And they invested heavily. 
And in doing so, they marshaled the power of personality. Mr. Kushner was developing very close relationships with these two, one MBZ, one MBS. The Trump administration was backstopping him by giving Saudi Arabia in particular a wide field of running room in Yemen with respect to arms sales. And of course, acquiescing, if not supporting their repressive policies at home and the cover-up, clearly, in the murder and dismemberment of Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, next week, by the way, it'll be two years since his death. So I, I think they went about this in a methodical way. I think they deserve credit for that, but I, I think they would not have succeeded had the region not offered up a number of trend lines that played into this notion that Arab-Israeli accommodation and even normalization might be possible. Uh, a rising Iran, Gulf upset with the Obama administration's negotiations with Iran, the fear of transnational Sunni jihadis, and a exhaustion, frustration with the interminable problem of Palestine, which even the Arabs were, were growing increasingly frustrated and disenchanted about. How many others will follow? The Emiratis, things are becoming more complicated with Sudan, we see that. Um, Morocco has a public opinion. I don't know how fast they'll come along. And the Saudis, I think, will certainly be the last to fall. But that combined with one other point I raised, and that is the left and the peace camps have always made the argument that Israel would become a pariah nation if it didn't settle up with the Palestinians, what I find so remarkable over the last decade is that Israel, under the tenure of Benjamin Netanyahu and some of the most right-wing governments in Israel's history, have expanded their relations into Africa, Latin America, Europe, Asia, in a way that's unprecedented. The Israelis are now accepted in, in more countries than at any time since independence. So let me, and I, uh, I find that to be, uh, frankly, stunning. Right. And, and you're right that, too. And I think it's, it's, it's a very fair point that a lot of the conventional wisdoms have been uh, slayed by, by, by what's happened. I want to come just to, to focus more on the Trump administration and the achievement that this represents. I want, want to ask you whether you think, and I suspect all three of us would agree with almost nothing about what Trump has done or stands for, but putting that aside... Do you think there's anything in his method that should be learned by any of his successors? And by his method, I mean his tendency to ignore the critics at home or even the sensitivities of some of America's traditional partners and just say, I'm going to do it what I think is right. And when I look back at what some of his predecessors done, Democrats in particular that I've worked for, there seems to sometimes be a fear of one's own shadow. What is going to be the reaction from the media? What's going to be the reaction from our allies? Trump doesn't seem to care so much about that. Do you see any value in that method that could be used by others? Um, I do. Uh, and I think North Korea was an example of that. He broke a paradigm that previous administration had uh, tethered their policy to, to essentially stop talking about North Korea, but start talking to it. And he broke out with several summits and personal diplomacy and love letters. That was, uh, I think, an unusual step, and that freed him from a traditional consensus that might. I don't ha didn't have high expectations here because it would have had to have been accompanied by serious diplomacy involving a realistic conception of what Kim Jong-un was prepared to do with respect to nonproliferation and disarmament. It would have had to have a very transactional step-by-step -step approach. And some members of the Trump team, particularly John Bolton, wasn't interested. And I think in, in the end, uh, I think Trump wanted a big bang. And a big bang would not have resulted from a sort of highly complicated structural framework on arms control that would have left Kim as an acknowledged nuclear power. Because that would have been, I think, the price Trump would have had to pay that politically might not have been acceptable to him. I mean, you could argue, I suppose, that focusing Europe on, on the need to generate their own defense concept, uh, trying to get allies to be more responsible for their own defense needs. I mean, those, those are reasonable breakout strategies, but they were accompanied by, you know, a degree of diplomatic malpractice that turned disruption into 
particularly if, if there's another four years here into destruction. Yeah. yeah, again, I don't want to comment so much on the substance, but I do think, and we could come back to it, that there's something about his, uh, I don't care what people think so much in the moment that might be learned. But Naz, I'm sure you have a, a slew of questions you would like to ask as well. Yeah, Aaron, thanks so much. I think one question I wanted to start with is, you know, Trump says himself, we took an approach. And I, I guess my question is, with your experience and, and with the number of uh, presidents and approaches that you have worked with, is this a foreign policy, one? And two, does it matter? So uh, does it, it does it matter that there be an American foreign policy that is tied to a particular set of values or goals? Or is this, uh, if we're going to use the disruption or perhaps the word malpractice, is this uh, an approach that once in a while is successful and once in a while is catastrophic, but is untethered to any broader theory or idea of what it means to be America in the world? No, I mean, I think previous administrations, going back to those that uh, followed Franklin Roosevelt operated more or less from a sort of common script with respect to how they saw the world. I mean, 60 years of Cold War between the former Soviet Union and the United States, efforts on the on part of the United States to enlist and marshal allies, to use foreign assistance around the world, to create some value propositions in the way it projected its approach to human rights. And that was accompanied, of course, by enormous numbers of mistakes, Asian wars that were never won, clandestine intelligence operations by the CIA, which undermined American credibility and confidence. I think, though, when you look back at the last four or five presidents, that Trump's approach to foreign policy, and I wanted to make this point, is really not driven by foreign policy. It's driven by three elements, which make the pursuit of a rational, logical, comprehensive understanding of the American national interest, in my judgment, virtually impossible. First, all presidents tether their foreign policies toward domestic politics. There's no doubt. If you don't have a sustainable domestic consensus, you can't have a sustainable foreign policy. But never, in my experience, have I seen administration that has subordinated most, I mean, all, almost all of its foreign policy initiatives to pleasing, satisfying, or not alienating its, its various constituencies. I mean, you see that in so many cases, withdrawal from Paris climate, a decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel, withdrawing from the Iran agreement. That's number one. Number two, never, all presidents, all new administrations seek to separate themselves from their predecessors. All, without, without a doubt. Never have I seen an administration that is still four years in. It's, aston it's astounding using Barack Obama Obsessed. and his administration yeah. as the yeah. North Star yeah. to guide their policy. I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable. Yeah. The Obama administration represents for Trump, you know, Satan's finger on earth, and he somehow cannot get it out of his system. And then finally, of course, there is the other thing that we've never seen in any of our presidents, not even Richard Nixon, which is the inability to turn the M in me upside down so it becomes a W in we. His foreign policy is vanity diplomacy. It puts him, his needs, his requirements, his personal sensibilities, his likes and dislikes at the center of just about everything that he does. I don't think, frankly, as much as I value and have come to believe in the importance of personal relationships in foreign policy, that that's a cautionary tale. Presidents who believe wrongly that their powers of persuasion can somehow override decades of national interest or entrenched narratives on the part of the negotiators they're trying to persuade, make a fundamental mistake. But Trump has gone way, way beyond that. So, you know, on balance, if I were to identify the one thing about the Trump administration that I think 
they actually got right, and that is important to American prosperity and security. It's the unwillingness to risk getting involved in these billion dollar, trillion dollar social science experiments, mm. and to admit that when withdrawal takes place from Afghanistan, it's going to be a good, probably be a good enough agreement, but not one that is going to check all the boxes that would in any way, shape or form justify the sacrifices that Americans have made or the sacrifices that the Afghan people have made. Can I ask one follow up, Aaron? And I and I think those three factors that you identify are really helpful. I, to a certain extent, all three of us have built our careers on the idea that expertise matters, that foreign policy and foreign relations require time and experience and knowledge of a region or a language. It, how much does the Trump approach question the idea that you need people advising foreign policy who actually know something about foreign policy? Is this a disruption of the notion of expertise as we tend to traditionally think of it? Uh, I mean, first of all, there's no question that that is the case. I mean, the counterpoint to that is look at the second Bush administration, yeah. where you had surrounding the president, all of the advisors that had provided extraordinary advice to his father. And at all of them, mm. with common sense, credibility, enormous expertise, ended up endorsing, for many different reasons, probably one of the most galactic mistakes in the history of American foreign policy. That said, that was, Iraq was a response to another aberrant event, which was 9-11. So in a way, you could say that that wasn't a wholesale abandonment of expertise. It was an effort to sort of adjust to what this group saw as a threat to the United States. But in Trump's case, I'm just stunned. And I, I tell you a short story. I, I think I've told it to Rob, which demonstrates the importance of curiosity in a president. I remember in, in the early 80s, I was a young INR analyst charged with following State Department charged with following Israel's policies in Lebanon. This was during the invasion. And I'm sitting at my desk one morning and the phone rings and it's the White House sit room. And I'm listening, waiting, waiting. All of a sudden, the next voice I hear is, Aaron, yeah, this is Vice President George H.W. Bush on the phone. And this is what he says. I know you're really busy, <laughs> but I read one of your memos on Lebanon. Do you have a few minutes to talk about it? All right, so I got off the phone and I thought to myself, you know, Kennedy used to call the Vietnam analysts at INR mm. when he wanted another opinion. I mean, Bush knew what he didn't know and he was in a hurry to find out. That element, it's not just necessary or sufficient. I mean, it, it makes it's the essence of sound decision making. Mm. And it doesn't exist here. But again, it's back to the vanity problem and the narcissism problem. This is Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Today, we are talking with Aaron Miller. You know, I think the kindest thing one could say about the Trump administration, then I want to ask you one, one more question is that President Trump uh, has consistently provided the wrong answers to interesting questions. Because he has asked questions about the utility of NATO or the utility of our foreign presence in certain countries, mm. but systematically, for the reasons you gave, come up with answers that are not grounded in values or national interests, but in something else. I'll ask you, you know, you know our organization, Crisis Group, what we're about is resolving conflicts, trying to resolve conflicts, prevent conflicts. Putting on your, your, your back now, your, your Middle East hat, uh, you've worked on Israeli-Palestinian, Israeli-Arab conflicts now for decades and decades. What would you say are the lessons you've learned about what it takes to resolve conflict? What are the ingredients that are needed? You know, again, we struggle day in, day out around the world with that question. I can't say we found the right answer, but I'm curious what you would say. I mean, each conflict has its own idiosyncrasies and its own rhythm and its own logic. But I, I think building on our unhappy experience in the Arab-Israeli issue, I think that there are three elements which, if you had the first two or one of the first two and the third, you might be able to do something serious. One 
is the existence of leaders who are masters of their political houses, not prisoners of their politics or, or their ideologies. Every time you've had any breakthrough in the region, no matter how it evolved, you had a leader who was willing to do something that was actually quite remarkable. Without that, I don't see how conflicts, particularly of the entrenched variety, which are driven by historical trauma, wounding, religion, competition over sacred space and territory. That's number one. Number two, you really do need a sense of ownership. You've heard the expression in the history of the world, nobody ever washed a rental car. <laughs> well, people don't wash rental cars because they care only about what they own. And if I were to tell you that every breakthrough in the Arab-Israeli conflict occurred without the direct foreknowledge of the United States, it would be a demonstration of the fact that that sense of investment, driven by pain very often and by prospects of gain is critical. And finally, if you had one of those two, you need a third. You need an effective third party with support from others who knew what they were doing and had the willingness and the ability to bring to bear the kinds of, I call them incentives and disincentives, that would build on the party's own desires to, to reach an agreement. I'm in the middle of The Man Who Ran Washington, the book about James Baker. I'm just reminded that the last time we had an effective foreign policy in this country, the last time we were truly feared, respected, and admired was that short four-year run, 1989 to 1992. If I could hit a rewind button and I could make it possible that Rabin would not have been murdered and Bush 41 would not have lost to Bill Clinton, I think that there was a reasonable possibility that we would have had one agreement between Israel and Syria or Israel and the Palestinians. And all of us would be having a different conversation today. Yeah, well, who knows? We've debated that as well. And uh, I just want to say, I think we've come to the end of the conversation. And I'm sure our listeners uh, understand why I enjoy talking to you so much and why I'm always left hungry for more. Thanks for your time. And if okay, I hope you'll agree to, to come back. Oh, for sure. It was wonderful talking to you and Naz, uh, and I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Rob, before we go, I was wondering if you could tell us what we should be reading from the crisis group this week. Well, we just mentioned the flare-up in Nagorno-Karabakh, and we issued a statement on that conflict this week. We also have one of our sort of most important publications, uh, which is the EU Watch List, which, which mentions some of the conflicts that the EU should pay attention to. The fall edition has come up, and it has a whole host of, of conflicts that we believe the European Union can and should pay attention to and do something about. Also a briefing in French, for those uh, of, of our listeners who speak French, on the uh, situation in Côte d'Ivoire, a very tense situation as elections are approaching and when all the heavyweights from the past are coming and sort of preventing the new generation of, uh, of politicians trying to, to take the country forward. And finally, a uh, shout out to two of our other podcasts that Crisis Group puts out. One, uh, War and Peace, which is our European podcast. And this week, they're discussing uh, the situation in Ukraine. And then our podcast on the Horn of Africa called The Horn, which uh, is always a great resource for anyone who's interested in that critical region of the world. So that's what we have for this week. That is it for this week. Thank you for listening to Hold Your Fire. Feel free to send any questions you have to media at crisisgroup.org and we'll be happy to address them next week. And if you're listening through iTunes, leave us a rating or a review. Have a good week, everyone. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.